like a once in a lifetime thing where you, you're seeing the monetization of a new money. I think it was around like 70 or $80. I just started saying, ah, oh, screw it. I'm just going to buy some. And that, that, that's how I ended up like buy, buying those. But I, I would have had a lot more had I just bought at the beginning. If you believe that Bitcoin is going to be the money that's hardest and most desirable, then all other monies are going to disappear. That's just reality. Um, it's kind of, kind of the wrong tool to use. Is it, it, the, the right tool to use is the dollar per Bitcoin or whatever, or like some cycle theory or whatever. It, like it's all like kind of mental masturbation or whatever. My name is Luke Broyles and this is the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. If you want to learn more about Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, have macro insights, I highly encourage you to check out our free newsletter that we give out every single week to over 100,000 current subscribers. The link is in the description as well as also online on our website. So please take a look at the link in the description below and enjoy this episode. Jimmy Song, thank you for joining me. Hey Luke, it's good to be here and uh, good to be in Prague. Yep, yep, we're in Prague at the Bitcoin uh, or BTC Prague mm -hmm. conference, and you are dressed to the nines. <laughs> we, we, I was just asking you, um, what days do you decide to dress up, and which days do you decide to not do that? What's your, what's your decision making process every morning? Yeah, well, well, first of all, if I'm traveling, I only have like one suit, and you don't want to show up in the same clothes the second day, so you have to reserve the good clothes for the day you're on stage. At least that's my opinion. Of course, um, when I went on stage with Mike and Sears and, uh, and uh, who was it, uh, Craig earlier, uh, you know, they, they were like, oh my God, you're gonna make us look bad. I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. I'm the moderator, I can do that. Um, but yeah, I, I, like, I like to, uh, you know, wear f fitted suits. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of fitted suits. I, I think, that's like the best bargain for men, period. Mm -hmm. Like you could get like a $5,000 Armani suit that's not fitted and you could get a $300 suit that is fitted. The $300 suit will look better 100% of the time. So as a man, I think you need a fitted suit. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially like for your wedding and things like that, you want the fitted tux, mm -hmm. you, want, you, want, you want things that fit right. You know? mm -hmm. Just, yeah, so. Little rant there. I'm trying to meme into existence this, uh, you know, well-dressed Bitcoiner, yep. sort of like meme. Um, I don't know if it's happening yet, but you know, maybe well, eventually. It's yeah. going on right here. Yeah, <laughs> that's just. Sure. I'm just I, I tried to get the cowboy hat thing too, but you know, that right. was more. Uh, I think that has been memed into existence. Yeah, that that has been memed into existence. Usually, it's just anyone wearing a cowboy hat saying, "I I I got to see Jimmy's song." Um, right, right. But yeah, I we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Whenever someone, so the last show we did was in LA together. Mm -hmm. I can't believe the last year already. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes people, and I laugh every time, which is why I remember it. But they'll be like, "Oh, I really like that discussion you did with mm -hmm. the with that Asian guy with the with the cowboy hat. <laughs> Who was that?" Or they'll be like, "Jimmy Song. Where do I know that name?" Oh yeah, the the guy with the cowboy. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, I think you have successfully memed that into existence. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean that that's been sort of like my trademark for a right. while. So right. Yeah, it, it helps. Yeah. yeah. So. As you just said, you've been in Bitcoin a while. Mm -hmm. um, tw 2011 was when you got into Bitcoin mm -hmm. Core, right? I'm trying to remember. And yeah, Bitcoin is whatever. What was it? Ten, thirty dollars, something like that. It went from one dollar to thirty, back down to about four or five dollars by the end of the year. Right, right. Okay. So I, I know last time we talked about, and you, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're always saying the same message again over and over, but. We're here in Prague, 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another halving has happened since mm -hmm. we talked last. Uh, the Bitcoin halving has gone from six and a quarter to three and an eight mm -hmm. Bitcoin per block. What are your thoughts? I mean, on one hand, nothing's changed because TikTok next block. But on the other hand, the world keeps marching on. So yeah, I mean, the the big one was uh, people expected the price to rise more than it did. Um, I mean, we did hit an all time high, so that that was significant, but. I think people are a little disappointed that it didn't go higher. Um, I've always said the bull market happens about a year after the halving. Um, so we had the halving in April. I think next April is around when you can sort of start seeing some of that. But mm -hmm. hey, who knows? I mean, yeah. even if it doesn't, still have the hardest, most sound money in the world. That's that's the important thing, and that's that's what you got to concentrate on. All right. Now, you're, and speaking of that hardest money in the world, um, 
a lot of people in Bitcoin now are in Bitcoin for the number go up, right? Mm -hmm. Like I just said, you've been in Bitcoin way longer than most of us, mm -hmm. um, myself included, and people watching. Um, you've been to so many countries around the world. What is the humanitarian um, component of Bitcoin, the humanitarian mission of Bitcoin, that perhaps if people need yet another reason to own Bitcoin, hodl Bitcoin, or not trade Bitcoin, what would you say is your anecdotal life experience of witnessing so many more countries what most people are able to do yeah I, the the thing with most countries not in the u.s is that you really don't have good savings vehicles the u.s dollar is relatively good right um if you look at the m2 money supply expansion since 1959 it's about seven percent for the u.s dollar um but if you take the global m2 um, and you, you average out like uh, based on population or you weigh on um, population and so on, um, it ends up being 14%, right? That's significant debasement. So every um, seven years or something like, uh, something like that, you, you're basically having your savings. And that, that's, you know, that's the anti-having. That, that, that's, that's what most people are having to go through. Um, and that, that's not something that most people in the US or Western Europe really understand yet. Although like with inflation raging and stuff, they're, they're starting to get it. But that, that's, the, that's the real power of Bitcoin is this ability to not get the base on your savings. And that's, I think, where the real growth is happening. It's people recognizing, okay, well, if I keep it in this for a long time, and you know, almost everywhere in the world, there's at least some people that have kept it seven eight nine years those are the people that become sort of like the examples for the next generation um and th those are the people that get imitated because they're the rich people or whatever so th this is what I, uh what i think is the big sort of growth area is people really recognizing it for savings because right now for most people in the world outside the u.s the dollar is their savings mm -hmm. this, this is how they they sort of keep their value starting to shift just a little bit right but when it fully shifts that's that's when we're going to see some real crazy stuff mm -hmm. yeah. now we're both christians mm -hmm. and i'm curious asking from the christian standpoint so that's a humanitarian argument mm -hmm. you were at the oslo freedom forum mm -hmm. literally last week right mm -hmm. um but i'm curious also from that aspect jesus uh the great commission you mm -hmm. know said go out love all your neighbors mm -hmm. um and you, you know and love yourself right and mm -hmm. a lot of people will call that a universal rule you know i think christians mm -hmm. would either you know some would agree some would disagree with that but um at the end of the day jesus jesus commanded his followers to go out and love people all around the world mm -hmm. obviously in all aspects right and so i'm curious what is your pitch to the christians watching this maybe their local pastors watching this interview mm -hmm. maybe they're uh, people managing some sort of other Nonprofit, maybe not even an explicitly Christian organization, but mm. what is your argument to those people that also have a theological or philosophical component in, uh, with their uh, with their organization as well? Why should they care about Bitcoin, and what can they do to accelerate that? Yeah, I, the the bigger issue is not so much you need to be using Bitcoin; it's more that fiat is ruining your organization, whether you know it or not. And uh, and this is pretty obvious if you look at like any church budget or any nonprofit budget or anything like that. Um, first of all, most of them don't have any savings. They're not incentivized to have savings because the money is the base, and they uh, they almost all spend up to their limit. If you're if you're a church, yeah, I mean maybe some of them are saving up for a building fund, something like that. But but for the vast majority of them they are not saving at all. In fact, many are running deficits and they, they have to do some sort of reverse mortgage on the property that they own. They become like real estate property managers where you know, you're renting it out to a preschool during the week, you charge money for weddings and stuff like that. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a real estate manager, but are you really doing the work of God if that's a large part of your finances is doing mm -hmm. um, real estate management? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, so fiat money is ruining your organization, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where you really need to understand how it's affecting your organization. Because mm -hmm. for most organizations, you don't have savings. You have very little buffer. You are like very fragile as a result, which is why a lot of churches like, you know, they, they don't last that long, right? Mo modern ones, a lot of mo nonprofits, a lot of organizations, period. 
because you're all levered up on debt and that that makes you fragile and one one thing goes wrong next thing you know you're you're dead and right. over a long enough timeline you're going to have various disasters if you don't have savings then you can't you, you can't really survive those um, so savings is an important part of sort of uh, lasting uh, of longevity in in general uh, but with the savings vehicles that we have, you know, that's not really possible. Um, your, your savings, if, especially if you're debasing at 14% a year, every seven years, you lose half. That's mm -hmm. it's like you're, you're not going to last that long and you're, you're not going to do very well doing that. Uh, so you, you need a different vehicle. You either need an active management team that's like uh, investing that stuff and there are rules around all kinds of nonprofits and churches and stuff and investing any savings you have you usually have to put it into a money market fund which is basically a dollar with with maybe like uh, you know a treasury interest rate or something yeah. like that like it's it's not it's not much uh, so you're, you're still getting the base so mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not a it's not a good system uh, what what you need is a savings vehicle that lets you last a long time right? right that 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 gives you sort of that resilience and anti-fragility so you can you can continue doing stuff because really like you know first rule of trading they say is like just don't blow up right don't go to zero yeah. just survive right and most churches can't even do that because you know you you have one generation leave and then like you know next generation doesn't want to attend church or something like that i've seen this happen with a lot of a lot of these, and uh, and they don't last that long. Companies too, like they're they're all levered up, and and uh, yeah, how many of them go bankrupt, right? Sears was a huge company like a hundred years ago. It's not it's not a, like it's, they they all do that because they, they don't have savings. So having a good store of value is a critical piece of lasting a long time. And if you care about the future, this this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to be saving in the dollar. You need an alternative. And if you do some honest intellectual work on what is the best savings vehicle, you're going to come to Bitcoin eventually. Yeah. So that that would be my argument. Um, you know, do you really care about your organization at a long term level? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I think also in my personal experience with some organizations has been the, the bias of the, oh, well, we don't want to jeopardize our organization's survivability and by going a perceived all in on Bitcoin. No. But in reality, they're already going all in in that building and that piece uh -huh. of real estate or they're going all in on this or that the other right and so yeah. i think that's a big mental barrier they perhaps need to break yeah to get and, and the thing is like real estate has done very well right and um and typically what happens to a church is they they get a building early they they paid off their mortgage and their land and building appreciates significantly and that's usually what later on as as their um as they're disintegrating a little bit, that that's what they use as their savings. They sell off parcels of land or whatever, and I, I, I question whether that's that's really a wise re use of resources or whatever. Like land, land is there so people can live in it, do stuff with it. If you're using it as a savings vehicle, then it's not getting used for that purpose. It's not being productive mm -hmm. in, a, in a good way, and you're you're just sort of holding on to it. And th this this is why you have ghost cities in China and stuff people want savings vehicles so you have entire apartment buildings where no one lives and mm -hmm. that's not a good use of labor that's not a good use of resources but that's what ends up happening you know when when you use land or buildings as uh, as a savings vehicle you you really don't want to live in a world like that and it, where it's high, it, completely inefficient you want to use a savings vehicle for a mm -hmm. savings vehicle not right. something else right so i i really agree with that i think you know, Jesus Christ described how the church is about the individuals in the church, and it's mm -hmm. about the relations in the church and unification with, mm -hmm. with God and the Holy Spirit. And then the American Christian religion or the mm -hmm. American uh, interpretation of the Gospels is this very much prosperity, gospel focus, mm -hmm. very much over attribution to the building, to the things, to the stuff in of itself. And so I, I really agree with the things you're describing. Um, but to back up a little bit of why Bitcoin is that in the first place, mm -hmm. right? So, Jimmy, you know, you've been doing this Bitcoin thing since 2011, mm -hmm. you know, core dev, you've written the books, you've done, all, you've done all the conferences, you've done all that. Let's explain to the people, especially those that are newer, as the cycle mm -hmm. number goes up, more people are new, 
why is Bitcoin is why is Bitcoin that solution? You know, why does a, yeah. a series of ones and zeros, of which you've helped mm -hmm. create and edit um, and, and and protect over the years, why is that better than land? How is that? The better use of resources that's yeah i so you you have to learn what money is right? right and that that's something that can take us like a few hours to to explain and so on um if you're really curious go read the bitcoin standard or lynn alden's broken money those are those are two great books that sort of like explain it at like a very uh, fundamental level and if if you don't understand that then none of what i say kind of makes sense i would also add thank god for bitcoin jimmy's <laughs> book he's not going to promote his own book but i will for you that's yeah. also a good book yeah uh like and and once you understand money and what 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 it's supposed to do or how it works and um you know uh the properties of good money and so on then you'll realize land is a terrible money right uh, and it, it might be a decent savings vehicle only because people are fleeing out of the dollar or uh fiat currency uh, but it's it's not a very good uh, savings vehicle in like the purer sense. If if people didn't have, it's because people don't have good savings vehicles that they go into land and stocks and things like that. Whereas if if those things were valued for what they were and not have this sort of value premium, then it would go to the people that are using it for the right purpose. So if you own homes because you are uh, trying to beat inflation, trying to beat uh, monetary debasement. Well, guess what? That home gets bid up and doesn't go to the people that are actually trying to raise a family or something like that. And of course, we see this everywhere where millennials especially are being priced out of the market and they, they can't afford homes because they've been bid up so much by the people that are trying to use it as a savings vehicle. So, you know, some uh, you know boomer has like seven homes, you know, that's like six other families that could have homes if it, it didn't get bit up by the boomer. And they, they're not having children as a result, right? Like ultimately it ends up uh, hurting everybody, uh, hurting civilization because the resources are not allocated in the functional usage, right? And if if you understand money, then well, money money needs to be like a separate thing <laughs> instead of yeah. conflated with art or homes or stocks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Lots of people. What do you buy Bitcoin? I'm grown to do daily income in terms of Satoshi, but most people don't want to deal with the fact that Bitcoin mining is extremely low. And there is a lot of ongoing payment in these machines. And so, if you want to begin mining Bitcoin and experience those benefits without having to deal with the heat, shipping costs, or sound of these machines, you should consider posting Bitcoin mining. Click the link in the description below where you can learn about poster Bitcoin mining and Blackware Solutions. You can begin earning Bitcoin in a matter of moments without having to deal with lots of the difficulties it takes to start buying. In addition, you also get industrial energy prices, which you cannot compete with and vary the vast majority of residential scenarios. So if you want industrial energy prices, if you want the ease and convenience of hosted mining without the <laughs> difficulties of it, Please click the link in the description below where you can learn about how Blockverse Solutions is making this extremely easy for everyone. No matter where your skill level is, you can begin Bitcoin mining instantly in an extremely user-friendly way. The link is in the description below. Thank you. <laughs> can you explain why Bitcoin price then does not act like the other... So if you're describing real estate and stocks mm -hmm. and gold as the other things as these uh -huh. kind of proxy forms of money and you're mm -hmm. saying Bitcoin's a better one, why is it that then Bitcoin price does not act the same, right? I mean, obviously I would argue and you'd probably agree that, you know, these other systems are these open systems that mm -hmm. leak energy, right? Very much the sailor ethos. And Bitcoin is like this black hole mm -hmm. that's closed and preserved it, right? So can you touch on why is it the Bitcoin price does not behave the same as all of these other assets? Why is it so much more volatile? If it was better money, yeah. it'd be less volatile, surely, right? Well, I, it's it, it depends on what you're talking about with respect to volatility, right? Um, and actually, if you, if you look at it from a certain perspective, the volatility should be expected because Bitcoin has no central bank. Uh, if you look at 
every other fiat currency, there's a central bank that manages the exchange rate to the dollar. That's why they seem so stable. So I, I was looking at the Czech crown, right? Um, it, it's like right now 23 crowns to a dollar. And it's been around that for like the last seven or eight years, something mm -hmm. around that, maybe uh, plus or minus 10%. That's because there's a central bank that's managing the currency, making sure that it doesn't get too high or too low and taking the right actions to mm -hmm. do that. Now, Bitcoin doesn't have that, so it's going to seem a lot more volatile compared to these things. But that that uh, that volatility is taken away by the central bank. Um, now, some might say, oh, well, but that's good. Then, you know, like the, the Czech people are benefiting because the prices are more steady and so on. Uh, yeah, in the short term, but over the long term, that means that their currency gets debased uh, mm -hmm. more and more and more over over time. And in fact, if you look at a long term chart of the Czech crown uh, over versus the U.S. dollar, it's debased actually kind of significantly. And most most currencies end up doing that. So um, you you really don't uh, the part part of why Bitcoin is so volatile is that it, it is it does have that. Uh, monetizing uh, aspect to it. Uh, so more people are discovering it and so on. So the upside is is significant because uh, the more people use it as savings and money, the higher it goes. Uh, but that volatility comes with that. What, what people want is something that goes up steadily uh, but has no volatility and no such asset exists. If, if an ac asset like that existed, then it would get bid bid to nothing because this, this is what's happened in the fiat economy. Uh, you take out loans to go get more of that asset, and the and then like the ten percent a year becomes five percent a year, becomes two percent a year, or whatever. And all, all of the you know upside gets bid down by by the by the people that are money printing. So it it's but you know Bitcoin again. It's scarce and it it doesn't have this dynamic. Therefore, right. it's it's going to continue to rise. Now, said I, I don't know. Maybe as more people like do speculative attacks on Bitcoin, maybe the price stabilizes a little bit more because when the price is down, that's when the mo most speculative attack happens and the least happens when it's at the top and so on. Hmm. But and some of those get liquidated or whatever. So um, I I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah. Do you, would you say it's accurate to state that central banks want to keep prices stable because the whole fiat system is dependent on debt markets and debt markets need those stable prices and that by comparison, Bitcoin is extremely volatile because it's focused on productivity and innovation? Do you think that's a accurate oversimplification perhaps? Well, well, so central banks have no reason to exist, right? Like if the, the, the entire... I, like even if you want to argue in fiat terms, you could have the U.S. dollar and no other fiat currency, and then everything would run better. But because every government wants to steal from its people, they enforce through legal tender laws and so on. You have to use our currency so that we can extract more resources from you. It's a stealth tax. Inflation is a stealth tax that isn't legislated, is not transparent, and so on. But that. That, that's the reason why you have so many central banks. Um, if you didn't have central banks, first of all, like trade would be a lot easier because uh, there's a network effect of money and you, you converge on one money, which we did during the gold standard and so on. But this, this ability of governments to do stealth taxation, that's what every one of them wants, mm. which is why they're so pro, um, you know, their own central bank and so on. Right. Um, it, and in, in a sense, it's it's a rent-seeking part of the economy having your own currency and uh, removing that I, would would be good. But like, no government wants to give up that resource. So that right. that that's basically what's happening. So, what would you argue the proper role of government is then? Right. So obviously, mm -hmm. you know, again regarding Jesus and uh, the temple, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I I've been there where you know where Jesus said, uh, "Render to Caesars what is Caesars." Mm -hmm. Right. Many. Many Christians, many uh, Muslims, many Jews, many religions, and, and you know, just everyday people would say, but the government does have a right to tax citizens. We do need the government to do this and that. And so what would be your response to that? What makes the inflation, quote unquote, tax wrong? What makes these other taxes okay, if any at all? And what is the role of government in an idealized scenario? What, what well, I think taxation is theft and I'm an anarcho-capitalist, so I don't, I don't think any, <laughs> any form of taxation is really legitimate. 
uh, and you know, like, like people think like, okay, well, if uh, if you make it so that all contributions are voluntary, then like no one's ever going to do it. But you know, I, I, I don't know if you're part of the crowd help network, but voluntary contributions work just fine, right? Like, uh, and if you don't know about crowd help, it's it's like an alternative to uh, insurance where you control your own money. And if uh, if a network member requests some money for some help thing, you uh, and they request it, you you give it to them, and that that seems to work fine, right? Like a voluntary thing can work, and it can be communal, and you know it doesn't have to be like tragedy of the commons or whatever. As long as you have communal um, dynamics, right, where everyone knows everybody. Uh, that can work. It's only when you get so large that, like, people can't put a name to a face, and uh, you know they, they think they're getting it for free when really they're stealing from other people. That that it gets it, it gets weird. But I I don't think taxation is legitimate. I think it violates you know the eighth commandment: "Thou shalt not steal." And governments don't suddenly have the right to violate that commandment because they're the government. I I, I really don't think that's right. Um, now, that that's maybe an extreme position uh, from a Christian perspective, but you know, I mean, I I, I still think the Ten Commandments are part of the commandment. So, <laughs> like, uh, how how do you justify doing that? Maybe if you voted for it, but what if you didn't vote mm -hmm. for it? That's not really consent, and so on. Uh, so I I I, I don't think uh, that's that's legit. Um, now, if you think about like how governments came into place and so on, like what what are the legitimate concerns of government well like common defense something like that right if, if there's a bunch of i don't know viking hordes that are raiding your country and you want a common defense like that's a reasonable thing to um to organize around right uh, being able to defend yourself right, so that they're not picking you off one at a time um yeah that that's i think legitimate um but again it can it can be done without taxes or it can be done in a way where you preserve membership and so on and the people that don't want to don't get uh, don't have to pay but they also don't get the protection of that common defense and so on it's it's all voluntary and mm -hmm. i think that that sort of association is totally legitimate um and way more um consistent with biblical values than mm -hmm. it, uh, than sort of like the current system we have which is we have this overlord kind of uh organization that can, can control most aspects of your life uh without your consent largely and are controlled by i think frankly demonic beings um and doing really evil stuff all over the place um i i don't think that's legitimate at all no i i definitely do view central banks as a form of secular quasi religion that most of its members aren't really aware of right you have <laughs> you have the temple of monetary policy monetary uh -huh. policy is the mm -hmm. rule book that the, the religious text right you have you have people that um you know in, in a sense either pray or that or quote unquote or they try to get close to the quote unquote prophets of mm -hmm. you know central bank members or you know try to predict what you know how what's the next decree going to do right they mm -hmm. come out on a podium what 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 parallels do you see between uh man-made religion and and fiat central banking and do you see that same thing in bitcoin because a lot of people would say bitcoin's a cult bitcoin's a religion and bitcoin's a bunch of crazy crazy cowboys yeah i mean i i i don't i i don't really know how to answer that question but i i mean to to some degree i think a lot of people um do put their faith in government for example um because it's a lot more comfortable uh, and that that becomes sort of like an idol because they they don't have to critically think for themselves or take responsibility for their own possessions or their lives even, uh, and instead depend on somebody else to take care of things for them, which is a very sort of like infantile like uh, mentality, right? Like want, wanting somebody to take care of you and not learning responsibility. I think that's completely against what the Bible teaches, which is that you know he he wants to make you into something. Right, like uh, the the whole purpose of this life is to prepare us for the next one, and it's to it's to put you into um, a position of virtue and character and Christ likeness, so that you can thrive in the next life. If you're being infantilized, like that's the opposite of what God God wants. So, in a sense, it's a it's a very um, 
very infantile religion, uh, the, this one of government dependence. Uh, and, you know, central banks obviously are a significant part of that because it, it's complicated enough that most people don't bother understanding it. And it's, uh, it's stealthy enough that most people don't understand, like, when things go wrong, that it's actually that thing's fault. Um, and, you know, the, don't have sort of like the, uh, the mental uh, words or uh, thoughts to be able to even blame it on the central bank. Uh, but but that that is what it is, and in, in that sense, I think, you know, it's it's a lot more like sin, sort of disguising itself as sort of an idol or a god or an addiction or something like that. Um, and you know, unfortunately, too many people have been deceived and continue to, um, you know, think of these sort of mobsterish organizations as legitimate when they're really not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's very clear in the Bible that the ultimate, that the ultimate sin or the or the, the unforgivable sin is pride, basically mm -hmm. putting oneself over God, or you know that's that's the the fruit, Adam mm -hmm. and Eve, right? It's saying we want to make our own rules above God's rules and mm -hmm. creating monetary energy out of thin air with fiat. In a sense, I would say is um, saying that I can say quote unquote let there be light and I can just make stuff out of thin air. And, yeah, and yeah, it, right? it's very it's sort of like great. ex nihilo thinking uh, and. Think, uh, thinking that that's legitimate, um, which it's not, and right. yeah, it's making yourself out to be bad. So if we can kind of expose a little bit of what you were saying, it's very subtle, and the mm -hmm. theft is very subtle. If we can talk about unit bias a little bit. So like mm -hmm. mentioned before, we're here um, in the Czech Republic in Prague. Price is here. I I've not gotten used to it. You've been here four times mm -hmm. in, in Prague already, but every time I open a restaurant menu or, or I'm spending money mm -hmm. anywhere, like... I see yeah. three digits. It's like five hundred for a burger. Oh, oh right. Oh right. It's, yeah. it's twenty three to one or twenty five yeah. to one dollars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so unit bias is uh, definitely continuously. You know, even mm -hmm. you know, it's emotional, right? Like every mm -hmm. time I have an emotional reaction until the logic kicks in, and and, and so in regards to Bitcoin, uh, you were around when Bitcoin was ten dollars or so, mm -hmm. right? Then it went to a hundred, mm -hmm. then a thousand, then mm -hmm. ten thousand. Now we're closing in on a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. And I think we both agree probably going to a million and 10 million and beyond that mm -hmm. eventually in the future. And most people, I think, are scared to buy Bitcoin because they've seen it when it was $100 and when mm -hmm. it was $1,000 or whatever. And so uh, perhaps we, if, if you wouldn't mind expanding on this, uh, what logic would you encourage people to consider mm -hmm. to hopefully get past that emotional bias of, dang, I should have bought Bitcoin when it was cheaper and now I'm not going to buy it and wait for a little more dip. Yeah, I mean, so that's not necessarily unit bias. That's mm -hmm. like an anchoring bias. Yeah, and that, that, that's uh, a better answer, um, yeah. Uh, so unit bias is like, okay, I just want more units of something even if, uh, I mean, like one, 100 over a billion is the same as one over, you know, uh, 10 million or whatever. But like people don't think that way. Um, that that's a little bit of a separate thing but anchoring bias is completely normal and uh, a lot of people are very uh resistant uh, to buying something if they've seen it at one price right like because it they, it's been anchored in their mind that way um and it, it takes some amount of time to sort of come out of that mentality um and it's it's sort of realizing that you can't turn time back uh that the implicit assumption in seeing one price is that, oh, I'm going to see it again. And that's how humans work, right? You, you've seen something. It's like, okay, uh, it, it's going to happen again because I've seen it before. Um, except that that's, this is sort of like a once-in-a-lifetime thing where you, you're seeing the monetization of a new money. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult for um, people to get out of that habit. And that sort of instinct that, okay, well, it, it'll come back to this. There's some legitimacy to that because almost everything else in nature, almost everything else, even in the fiat economy, tends to do this fluctuation and so on. But at the same time, you know, like, would you not buy a house because, you know, 30 years ago it was, uh, you know, $45,000, right? Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? That, but that that's kind of how you have to think of these things. It's well, there, there's more money being printed. And yeah, like the, the units, the denominator is constantly increasing. You're, you're, you're thinking in terms of um, you know, dollar as a unit of account, but it's, it's a bad unit of account, so it's constantly expanding. 
Uh, if you're not buying pizza now because 30 years ago you were able to buy it for 85 cents and now, you know, like a slice for 85 cents and now it's like four bucks. Well, I mean, you're 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 not being really rational and you're you're not recognizing the actual monetary expansion. So kind of have to take that into account if you're going to think about Bitcoin and buying here or then or whatever, because money is changing all the time. And that once you sort of internalize that reality, then you realize, OK, if I keep it in the dollar, this is a sinking ship. And, you know, this this is my rescue, um, you know, then then you're going to get out as soon as possible every single time. Mm -hmm. Did you have to go through the anchoring bias for you personally? Because, you know, you your first couple bull markets, I'm sure you were amazed by just the multiples yeah. that skyrocketed by. Like, what was that for you on a personal yeah. level? Yeah, like, so, I mean, so I put a limit order on Mt. Gox on, like, when, when I would buy, and I actually hit it. So I think that taught me some terrible habits because what ended up happening was through most of 2012, I kept trying to buy more, but I kept lowering it because I got greedy, right? I'm like, uh, okay, I can buy it at this price or this price. And actually, like, I, um, I had moved from Boston to Texas in 2012 and uh, ended up selling a condo that I had and I had some money. And I, I told my wife, okay, I want to put this money into Bitcoin. She's like, okay, that's fine. Like, do do whatever. And it was it wasn't a small amount of money. Uh, I mean, it wasn't that much either. But it it was it was it was like a decent amount. And I was like, okay, I'll I'll buy it. At, and this was like at towards the end of 2012 when when all the transactions closed. So I was like, okay. So I started doing the same thing. Always like sort of placing it like 40 or 50 percent below the current market price, thinking it'll go lower. And the thing about early 2013 was that it never it, it never did that, right? Like, uh, and like a, a week, two weeks goes goes by, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I bought it for this much lower price before, so it'll, you know, I'm willing to pay a premium, but not this much of a premium, right? Uh, and all through like that first quarter of 2013, I was constantly like, oh man, I I, I just kept bringing up the limit higher and higher to see if I can catch it. Um, and it, it, it never did. And so I think it was around like 70 or $80. I just started saying, ah, oh, screw it. I'm just going to buy some, right? And, and I, I dollar cost averaged all the way to the top. And and that that that's how I ended up like buy, buying those. But I, I would have had a lot more had I just bought at the beginning. But because I was taught or I, I I had this anchoring bias. I did I didn't do that, and that ended up kind of screwing me over. Uh, but it's a good lesson because later on I just you know started seeing fiat money as this uh, sinking ship. So right. I, I was way more willing to just go into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I really like the Samson Mal approach of pricing Bitcoin as like cents on the dollar uh -huh. at a million, right? Uh -huh. So. If Bitcoin is $50,000, it's, uh -huh. it's zero, <laughs> yeah, 0 0.05 M, uh -huh. right? Or if it's seven, uh -huh. 70,000, it's 0 0.07 M. And mm -hmm. when people often mm -hmm. tell me they're trying to do the thing that you were doing in 2013, mm -hmm. they're like trying to buy a little bit cheaper. Like I always remind them, it's like, okay, you can buy this asset for four cents on the dollar mm -hmm. or six cents on the dollar or eight and a half cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't matter. You're buying it under a dime, right? Yeah. So... Well, it, yeah. it's a, it also has sort of like a, a heart of greed into it uh, to sort of like bring it back to the Christian aspect because we, we all kind of want to deal, right? right? We don't, we don't, uh, we, we want to rip the other person off sort of. <laughs> and that, that, that's the instinct at play when you're trying to always kind of go, go a little cheaper than what the market, the market's the market, right? Like that's what everyone is willing to buy and sell for. If you buy it at that price, then that's, that's what you're going to get. If you're, if you're, being greedy and trying trying to do that, you're kind of trying to pick up pennies in front of a steamroller or something. Um, you you might not get in at all if you do that too much, uh, and that's that's the real danger here. Um, I mean, yeah, like some of those trades might work, and that'll probably teach you bad habits. Uh, yeah. But you know, like the it's the one time when you really should have bought that you don't, and that that ends up screwing you over. Right. So. Um, yeah, just get get off the fiat ship. That's 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 right. the message. So that's that's a great summary of anchoring bias. Um, mm. Like I incorrectly called it unit bias. You're right. It's anchoring bias. There is also still unit bias though. Mm. That people 
back in your you know mm -hmm. your early days 2013 or so you know their unit bias was i got to get to a thousand coins otherwise i'm too late to bitcoin uh -huh. and then it was i got to get to 100 coins otherwise i'm too uh -huh. late to bitcoin and i've got to get to 10 coins and went too late to bitcoin and now we're at the point where the last year or two especially we've seen people really focus on that get to one bitcoin message because that still feels achievable for people but jimmy i'm curious what you think but i think we could be entering in this cycle the real first time in history that we could be looking at a less than one bitcoin goal where people start saying get to 0 0.1 bitcoin or get to 0 0.5 bitcoin get to 1 million stats where it is so yeah so we've already talked about anchoring bias of pricing bitcoin in terms of dollars but there's also that unit bias of i don't have enough current i don't have enough monetary units within bitcoin what would be your encouragement to people that either don't feel like they have enough bitcoin mm -hmm. or enough sats or are brand new what would you encourage your sat stacking goal or their next leveling up to be yeah i mean uh like do what you can uh, i mean like i don't know what else to say if you're providing value you'll get paid yeah. and if you're getting paid you can you can buy bitcoin uh, i think using sats as the denomination is pretty effective 10 million sats sounds like a lot it's and it is a lot right like it that uh you know 0.1 bitcoin sounds like a small amount 10 million sets sounds reasonable and that's i think a reasonable stacking goal depending on what age you are and you know what skills you have and what value you provide to society and so on mm -hmm. so um you know like just provide value save and store it in bitcoin that's really like it's not a hard formula right that mm -hmm. you just just go save in Bitcoin it's, mm -hmm. and save, uh, you know, uh, if you know that your savings is growing, then you're, you're more likely to save. And that's definitely been happening mm -hmm. with Bitcoin. Doesn't the matter, the number ultimately doesn't matter, right? Like, right. because it's, it's more about saving. It's more about saving. It's more about health. It's more about the people. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's a really good tip you have of that. If people watching this feel like they're too late to Bitcoin, mm -hmm simply start viewing the life in terms of sats instead of terms of whole bitcoins because then you know that will trick their brain into thinking they have way more than they have it'll hopefully help mm -hmm. them be more content which ultimately my hope is that in bringing that contentness it lowers the probability they're going to trade it away right yeah so um so you mentioned greed mm -hmm. i have a question similar to that something i've been thinking a lot about recently is that everyone has this desire for greed or maybe a, mm -hmm. a more friendly term is status mm -hmm. we all want the higher number of square footage in our house we all want the bigger salary we all want this and that and the other and so michael saylor has bought way more bitcoin than mm -hmm. most billionaires ever have um and and so there's only about 1.7 million bitcoin on exchanges saylor not directly but under his company microstrategy has acquired about a quarter of a million uh -huh. and so my question there is that there's 750 billionaires mm -hmm. richer than michael saylor mm -hmm. and so theoretically only maybe five to ten of them are going to be able to compete quote unquote in that status game against saylor and so jimmy what do you think is going to happen when we have two other billionaires three other five ten twenty other billionaires all realizing that the only way that they can keep up their greed and status game against saylor is to follow the sailor strategy completely adopt it like like do you think that we're going to see a mass run on bitcoin's price just from a few of these way high up there billionaires trying to get their seat at at the status game table i i i don't know i mean like they might they might not like the the thing that billionaires do is um it's hard to predict and what's fashionable among them is uh very difficult to um assess and uh, like make no mistake billionaires are very fashion conscious and very um, trendy or whatever, right? right? There's a, like some billionaire, um, like a private boat, like a uh, path that they all take throughout the year. They, they start like at the Super Bowl or something and then they go to uh, like the art thing, Art Basel in Miami or something and then they go to this and that like they're and they're they're all in the same places right like it's it's that trendy and you're you're supposed to have your private boat at each of these places and you know fly jets or whatever but there, there are certain parties that they're all at and whatever does that world start getting into bitcoin i, I don't know i don't know if they do most of these people made money like being you know uh 
hedge fund traders or something like that. They're like very few, like, I mean, you, you have like the Bezos and Bill Gates of the world, but vast majority of them are actually like, like, uh, financial bros, right? Like, and they, they're, I, I, I don't know if they really end up getting Bitcoin. Um, the people, I think ultimately that, uh, that do get it, uh, I mean, billionaires will always have some, but it's not going to be like at the sailor level. I, I don't think, I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe you'll get another one like Michael Saylor. He, he's very different in that regard. He's a, it's not your typical billionaire. He, he's, um, definitely doing his own research and figuring things out for himself. Um, so I, I don't I don't know if that necessarily happens where you have four or five billionaires that are competing to like match with micro strategy or that it becomes a status symbol or anything like that. It's just, you know, uh, it's a better savings vehicle. I think the they're generally risk averse. Uh, they're billionaires for a reason. And, they, you know, their their big mantra is just don't lose it. Right. And so. Uh, they're going to be fairly conservative investments. At some point, it'll be a conservative investment, and they'll they'll do it. But that'll be way later. I think the people um, that'll get in are sort of at the fringes of the billionaire club, kind of like Michael Saylor yeah. or whatever. And th those are the people that kind of get into it. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think we'll see more more of those types of people coming in. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I I was uh, reading a long time ago about. Um, about how like every law firm got became like super Jewish, right? Like I and this 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 is like from the 30s and 40s, like you know what actually happened, and it was a uh, it was a lot of these Jewish law firms that took on these like shareholder fights and stuff, and they became prestigious. Previously, Jews would be excluded from the high the best law firms because they were Jewish, right? They're, a lot of these law firms were anti-Semitic, but they were because they were at the top they were more conservative and they they wouldn't take some of these like dirty stockholder share shareholder fights and so on so like a lot of a lot of these like uh firms that are the best law firms in new york now they they came out of that era because they were willing to kind of do the dirty work kind of see a similar dynamic maybe happen yeah yeah yeah, that's what I wonder is that even, you know, 750 billionaires richer than Sailor, even if 745 um, don't, don't you know, are, are fully fiat brainwashed, they're going to lose it all to the state. I wonder what happens if we get those five. So uh, now a lot of people would say, Jimmy, you're lucky because, yes, Bitcoin is still going to be the best performing asset in the next 10 years. It's mm -hmm. going to have great compound uh, growth rate. But, you know, you lived in the era where the market cap was so small mm -hmm. that it just went vertical, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people would say Bitcoin is going to be great, but it's going to have diminishing returns. It's going to stable out at, you know, whatever mm -hmm. is their number, half a million, a million, five million. The argument's still the same no matter the number they've mm -hmm. picked out of, uh, out of the air. Um, so what would be your either agreement, disagreement, or nuance to that take of diminishing returns? And, you know, maybe some people think fourth-year cycle theory is not dead, but it's getting increasingly dead every cycle or you know people have different theories about what bitcoin's monetization path is going to be over the next few cycles and decades what, what do you think with all of those different viewpoints well so if you believe that bitcoin is going to be the money that's hardest and most desirable then all other monies are going to disappear that's just reality uh there's a network effect to money unless you have you know guns and stuff like enforcing it um yeah, it's it's going to be one money uh, and getting out of the monies that are going to die is the rational thing to do. So, you know, I mean, you, you can come up with whatever fancy chart lines or whatever and say, oh, it's not going to break this price point or what. Um, it's kind of kind of the wrong tool to use is it, it, the, the right tool to use is money has a network effect because it's beneficial for everyone to be on the same money and people desire to hold the hardest scarcest most uh useful money mm -hmm. and that's bitcoin mm -hmm. so if that's the case then you know like the dollar per bitcoin or whatever or like some cycle theory or whatever it, like it's all like kind of mental masturbation or whatever Ultimately, the, the thing that matters is, well, what's going to be the thing that wins over everything else? You need to go put it into that. Now, you might not be certain, so 
you know, use your percentages accordingly. But like to not get in at all at this point and say Bitcoin is zero shot, that's the foolish move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. That even if Bitcoin had no future returns, mm -hmm. why would you still hold it? Down? Like it's not even really a choice. It's yeah. That, okay, maybe we even do have diminishing returns, but so what? You're still going to buy the Bitcoin anyway, yeah. right? Well, and you're yeah. going to lose money keeping it in dollars. So right, yeah. right. So if you believe the dollar is going to go away at some point mm -hmm. in the future. How do you think that's going to happen? Do you think that the dollar slowly continues to debase away for many, many decades? Do you think we have hyperinflation in the next couple of years? Do you think maybe eventually governments begin printing their own legal tender and bonds for Bitcoin that we kind of have this feedback loop where, you know, CPI is kind of flat, but Bitcoin goes goes vertical as liquidity and currency goes vertical? Like, what do you think is the prob the most probable outcome of how Fiat dies and Bitcoin takes over. Yeah, I mean that's that's a very hard question. Right? It depends on the actions of so many people that I can't predict. I, yeah. I I really don't know how to answer that question. It's possible it lasts way longer than you think, and then it just suddenly drops. Could be like uh, political monetary reform in a in some sort of almost miraculous mm -hmm. way. It could be lots of things. Who knows? Uh, right. But you know, hard money wins, right? Like it's. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know how how else to say it than that. Um, yeah. And you don't know exactly how it'll win, but it'll win. That's right. that's, uh, you know, as a Christian, that's kind of how I view the future as well. It's well, Christ is going to win and you want to be on the winning team. <laughs> that's it. Right. Like and now, how, like, how is Jesus going to come back? Is there going to be a thousand years of, you know, this and, you know, is there going to be a rapture and this uh, like Details don't matter that much. You just want to be on the right team when when he comes, right? Like, and you want to be on the right team when the do dollar disappears. Like, like the actual thing is, uh, like, uh, trying to predict using tea leaves or something. It, it's right. it's not really that fruitful, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, no, I, I still think that's a very valid answer because mm -hmm. people keep telling me these things, and it's like. If Jimmy Song has been around here 10 mm -hmm. years longer than you, that was here when Bitcoin is a thousand times cheaper than it is now, mm -hmm. doesn't have an idea, mm -hmm. then I don't think most people should probably be trading. I think you agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there is a discipline to trading, but uh, yeah. yeah, most people shouldn't be trading. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so we the last show we did uh, was in California back in October last year. Since then, obviously, the ETF has been approved. A lot of people would say, OK, Jimmy, I'm, I'm in for the long term. I'm not going to trade. I'm not going to sub subject myself to unit bias or anchoring bias. I'm going to buy and hodl, and I've I've gotten my BlackRock account and I've smashed by the ETF. Jimmy, am I good to go? No, oh, I, I I think the <laughs> ETF's the wrong vehicle because you don't know what they're doing behind the scenes. You're trusting BlackRock, so yeah, self custody. Um, scary because most people are not used to the responsibility of holding their own coins, but that's that's the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. What would be your top self custody tips for people, especially for beginners? Yeah, um, just get a hardware wallet and do single sig until you hit a certain amount that becomes scary. Then, then go go maybe do collaborative custody or something like that. But yeah, um, right. yeah. But start with a hardware wallet um, for any amount that's more than say your monthly salary. Yeah. 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 Definitely, because then you're limiting your downside, and then you know you upgrade. Um, solely at time, right? Mm -hmm. So that'd be my encouragement for people too. Um, so Jimmy, you go to so many conferences. A lot of people ask you these questions. You're you're pretty OG, right? And obviously, mm -hmm. in the future, if Bitcoin adoption 100x is way more people in the future are gonna um, even more and more appreciate the work you've done. So I'm curious, what's a question that you wish that you were asked more from people? I don't know. <laughs> uh, how do I become saved? I guess. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, Jimmy, how do I become <laughs> saved? <laughs> well, uh, pray to Jesus and ask him to reveal himself to you. That's that's uh, that's what I got. So, yeah, that's what you got. That's a good answer. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, thanks for your time. I want to respect your time. I know that uh, there's a lot going on. We'll make sure we get to see everyone. Um, mm -hmm. I have a little present here for you here. I, I don't I don't think you were expecting this, but um, I'm not. Yeah. So <laughs> so last time we saw each other, we were in South Africa back uh -huh. in January. You remember that? Uh, yeah. And you remember what we did together, right? 
the steak? Yeah, well, you, the, well, yeah, the steak yeah. dinner where you ate like literally how many pounds of steak? I don't even know. I, I had three steaks, but yeah, I did have a third steak. You had three <laughs> steaks and you considered a fourth. And these were yeah. big, big steaks. Uh, and they were delicious. Yeah. They, they, they yeah. were delicious. <laughs> anyway, no, no, not that. No, Jimmy, it was the next day. Uh, we went to see the penguins. You remember oh, that? Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so we went to see the little penguins in South uh -huh. Africa. And so I got a present here for you. Uh -huh. um, obviously, many people watching this... Um, Agreed, understand about how, you know, like South Africa example, mm -hmm. short time preference, right? Fiat mm -hmm. ruins everything, right? Mm -hmm. Including the penguins, mm -hmm. right? Basically all the fiat incentives have people there focused on, you know, monthly rent and short time mm -hmm. preference stuff. And so anyway, when we were there, uh, I was inspired by that to kind of get a token of thanks for 21 of my favorite <laughs> Bitcoiners in the space. So. Okay. So here we got Jimmy the penguin. <laughs> I'm <laughs> a penguin now. You, okay. You, you 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 have a penguin now. So okay. so Jimmy the penguin's um, uh, rehabilitation and sponsorship is in your name. So oh, wow. so now you have one little extra second order effect swimming out in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Okay. Well, my kids will love this. They love penguins. So yeah, I'll, say, yeah, I'll tell great. them. Okay, this one is uh, Jimmy's penguin. Jimmy's there penguin. There you go. <laughs> Jimmy, thanks for uh, your work. Thanks for your passion and appreciate everything you're doing. And the, the suit and hat definitely, definitely helps. So thanks for everything you're doing. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yep. Awesome.